Praise God, church. Praise God once again. Happy Sabbath. Happy day. The Lord is good and all the time. Wow. Amen. The Lord is good and that's his nature. I am so happy to see my friends from Tumaini. Kindly wave. Amen. Thank you so much for coming. They are my good friends, and uh, for those who have been attending church oftenly, um, we talked about our ministry to the children's home, and it was wonderful. We thank God because this far, the Lord has brought us. Amen? I also want to recognize the presence of proactive kids. Wave at me, children. How are you? God is good, and all the time. Yes, I'd like to welcome us all to this uh, fellowship this morning. And uh, I'm so humbled and privileged to be before you this day. As you heard, my name is Natalie Wanga, and uh, I'm the one the Lord has chosen today to break the bread of life. And indeed, it is a blessing. I am so much humbled. And I'd like to welcome all the children. Children, hello. Children, hello. Wave to me, children, from the congregation. Happy Sabbath. Happy day. Yeah, indeed, it is a blessing to have children amongst us. And uh, I don't know, I just love children. Looking at the world today and how much corrupt our society is, to see children seated at the feet of Jesus like this makes me so happy it fills my heart with joy because there is hope for tomorrow amen amen church there is hope for tomorrow and um i'd like to recognize the presence of my parents mom and dad kindly <laughs> just stand and wave mr and mrs wanga amen thank you so much um feel most welcome feel at the feet of jesus this day and uh our title for, our sermon title this day is, someone? I, you saw the poster, come on. Congregation, you are letting me down. Someone, a child or anyone? I'd, I love, I'd love a child to tell us. What is the sermon title? Anyone? Yes, I can see a hand over there. Yes? From the lips of, from the lips of, of infants. Thank you so much, my sister. God bless you. Children, what is our sermon title? From the lips of infants. Let's go. From the lips of infants. Amen. Church, what is our sermon title? Louder. Yes, from the lips of infants. And our key text comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 21, from verse 15 to 16. And uh, before I start, I'd like to uh, pray. And I'd, I'm requesting us to kindly maintain silence. We are in the presence of the Lord. Children, hello. Hello. We're in the presence of who? We are in the presence of God. And God is holy. God is holy. Let us keep silence, okay? Okay, let us pray. Our Father and our God in heaven, we are humbled before your throne this morning. And Lord, we want to thank you so much for the gift of children. Thank you for this Sabbath. Thank you for the children ministry. And God, thank you for blessing us with these little bundles of joy. And I ask that you may speak through me. I am the clay and you are the potter. Dear God, may you fill me with your Holy Spirit. May you be glorified. May you increase, dear God, as I decrease. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Once more, what is our sermon title? Louder. Yes, from the lips of infants. And our key text comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 21, from verse 15 to 16. Matthew 21, verse 15 to 16. And I'll request a child to read to us. Matthew chapter 21. Anyone? Matthew 21. Yes, my girl. You can rise up. 
Matthew 21 from verse 15 to 16. Oh, she's still getting out her Bible. Matthew 21. Yes, you can read. Matthew chapter 21, verse 15 to 16. And it says, yes. the chief priests, priests and the teachers of the law became angry when they saw the wonderful things he was doing. Mm -hmm. And the children shouting in the table, temple, mm -hmm. praise to the David's son. Mm -hmm. So they asked Jesus, do you hear what they are saying? Mm -hmm. Indeed I do, answered Jesus. Mm -hmm. Haven't you ever read this scripture? You have perf you you have trained children and babies to offer perfect praise. Amen. Thank you so much, our little brother. Thank you so much for that. Now we can see that the children were so excited to see Jesus and they were shouting praise to God. And uh, this verse is quoted, or rather Christ picked it from the book of Psalm chapter 8 verse 2. We shall read it later on. But we can see that the children spoke the truth and they were so happy to see Jesus. And it is so ironical that the children realized and actually declared that Jesus was the son of David. And they were like, Hosanna to the son of David. But the Pharisees were so blinded. The knowledgeable men of that time. I do not want to compare the Pharisees with our pastors today, but because I'm sure our pastors do not have the same spirit. But in terms of knowledge, then they were the leaders of that time. They were the church leaders of that time. And they were termed to be so knowledgeable, but yet they did not realize that Jesus was the son of David. Perhaps they realized they did not just want to accept it. And we can see from uh, verse... verse uh, Verse 15 says that they were indignant. My version says that they were indignant, meaning that they were, so, they were so angry. I mean, you know, there was just that feeling of uh, feeling low, like the children who are the least recognized this and actually declared it. But the Pharisees would not, they would not. And from their reaction, we can see that it, there was a different, the, uh, the fruit that they were having was the fruit of a different spirit other than the one spoken of in Galatians 5.22. My, uh, our children, you're going to help me preach today. You're, you're the ones going to read for me our text. Amen? Amen? Galatians 5.22. A child, kindly read. Galatians 5.22. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Any child who has it? There is a child over there. You have it. Yeah, Galatians 5, 22. You, yeah. Yes, you. Kindly pass the mic to her. Galatians 5, 22 says... But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, and goodness, faithfulness. Mm -hmm. 23. Gentle, gentleness, self-control. Again, as such, there is no law. Thank you so much, my sister. God bless you. The fruit of the Spirit is, let's say, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and... Amen. So the Pharisees weren't displaying this fruit of the Spirit. It means that a different spirit, other than the spirit that is being talked about here, was controlling them. And we definitely know what that spirit is, right? Right, church? It is the spirit of the devil himself. So unfortunate. It is so unfortunate. Um, as we said, verse 16 quotes the book of Psalms chapter 8, verse 2. Let's turn our Bibles. Psalms chapter 8, verse 2. A child should be ready. You're going to be my little preachers today. Psalm chapter 8, verse 2. Psalm 8, verse 2. Yes, Bruno. You'll read the next one. Okay, let Bruno read this one. Psalm chapter 8, verse 2.
from the lips of the children and, and infants, you have ordained pr praise mm -hmm. because of your enemies to listen, to silence the foe and, and the avenger. avenger. Thank you so much, Bruno. God used the children to silence the Pharisees in the book of Matthew. And just as the book of Psalms says, he, 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 out of the lips of children, he called his praise so that he may silence his enemies. Amen? Amen, church? So why did God need to silence his enemies anyway? So we have seen that the Pharisees were knowledgeable people of the law, and they had so much knowledge. But God chose the foolish things, quote-unquote foolish, fo the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. He chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. As it is written in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, we shall read. First Corinthians chapter one verse twenty seven. Mm -hmm. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame <coughs> the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Mm -hmm. Two twenty nine. So that no one may boost before him. Mm -hmm. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who, has be, who became for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Amen. Thank you so much. So God chose the foolish things. The Pharisees, of course, termed their children as foolish because they knew nothing about the law. They had not studied about the law, yet they knew that Jesus was the son of David. But the Pharisees, who had read for years and years and years, could not acknowledge that Jesus was indeed the son of God. Some of us today act like the Pharisees, parents, guardians, you know, uh, youths and people who are not children. We act like the Pharisees in that you cannot allow correction from a young child. You con we consider children as people who know nothing. We consider children as people who don't have a say anywhere. But I li I'd like to, to thank the Ministry of New Life because we really esteem children. But out here, people really do not esteem children that much. And children are at risk. Just as these children were, the, were at risk because of the anger of the Pharisees, so, uh, some of our children today are at risk because we do not acknowledge them and we belittle them. We make them feel like they do not have a say. We will not entertain, um, we will entertain pride in our hearts and not acknowledge the presence of these children because, um, because of the pride in our hearts. And it is so unfortunate because we do these things and come to church Sabbath in, Sabbath out, and we sing like we sing hymns like we are marching to Zion, my brother. Which Zion are you marching to? We sing hymns like, Oh Lord Jesus, how long? How long till you are judged, till you are condemned by your master, till Christ tells you the fearful words that I knew you not. Where are you marching to? Sabbath in, Sabbath out, we are here, with very broad smiles on our faces, hurting our children, making them feel like they are despised. And yet you think that you are awaiting Christ's return. You think that you are awaiting to be taken to heaven. And Adventists, we, you know, we are so knowledgeable and we are like, in the twinkle of an eye, we shall all, we shall all be what? My friend, you are looking at your brother. Changed, changed. The little children are being changed. You're wondering, kwani mungu alinisahau? And it's because of these little things that we do. Jesus says, Jesus really esteemed children. And I'd like us to, to read uh, another verse in the book of Matthew chapter 10, verse 42. Matthew 10, verse 42. Even as we read, I am not here to entirely condemn you and tell you that there is no hope. There is hope in Jesus. Amen? 
Amen? Jesus can change our hearts. Matthew chapter 10, verse 42. You can be sure that whoever gives even a drink of cold water to one of the least of those my followers, because he is my follower, will, will certainly receive a word. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, our, our opening song, Yes, Jesus Loves Me, stanza one says, They are weak, but he is. They are weak, but he is. Amen. Children are weak, yes, but Jesus is strong, and Jesus loves them so much. I'd like us to turn our books again to the book of Matthew, chapter 18, verse 5 to 6. We're just trying to see how much Jesus esteems children, and when we despise them, we are despising Christ. So, Matthew, chapter 18, verse 5 to 6, a child. And, who, and whoever welcomes in my name one such child as this welcomes mm -hmm. me. Amen. If anyone should cause one of these little children to lose his faith in me, mm -hmm. it will be better for, the, for that person to have a large millstone tied around his neck and mm -hmm. be drowned into the deep sea. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And let me just read verse 7. It says, Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. Jesus is telling us that he esteems children very much. And uh, anyone who causes one of these little ones to stumble, anyone who causes them to stumble, it is better for you. Can you imagine? It is better that a millstone were tied on your head and you were thrown into the sea. You can imagine the trauma, right? But that would be better as opposed to offending one of these little ones because they are highly esteemed in the eyes of God. And we do not seem to realize this. We despise them. We term them as being nothing. We, you know, we, they don't count at times. We... we this, we dismiss them away in our anger and forget that these little ones are precious in God's sight. Children, hello. Children, hello. How many know that we have guardian angels? What does a guardian angel do? Someone? Yes? Her mic, please. A guardian angel protects us from being Harmed. Yes, a guardian angel protects us from being harmed. Someone else shout yes. What does a guardian angel do? Yes, to guard our lives in Jesus. Shout from the back. To protect us. You? Yes, protect, protect, protect. Amen. Now, church, did you know that these little children's angels actually see God? Did you know? Your angel does not see God, my brother. <laughs> but his angel sees God. Amen? Let's read the book of Matthew chapter 18, verse 10. Matthew chapter 18, verse 10. A child? See that you don't despise any of these little ones. Mm -hmm. They are angels in heaven, I tell you, are always in the presence of my Father in heaven. Amen. Amen. The angels actually see God. And what does that mean? Um, you can remember the story when Moses, uh, Moses was talking to God and he, Moses asked God, Lord, please show me your face. And what did God tell him? I will pass before you, but you won't see my face, right? Why? Because God is holy. God is holy, and we have to conduct ourselves in reverence. And we have to teach our children that while we are in church, we are, in, we are on holy ground because we are standing in the presence of the king of the universe. Now, your angels, as, this, as I said, do not see God. Why? Because of sin, we have lived our lives so much and we are so much full of sin. But these little ones have not seen much in the world. And so their angels have the privilege to actually see God. And that means that God associates children with holiness. Amen? Amen, church? 
God associates children with holiness and we despise them. Why? That tells that the spirit dwelling in us is not the spirit of Christ. If we are busy despising our children, we dismiss them in anger. I mean, you are from work if you are a parent and your boss has given you a headache and your child is so happy to see you in the evening and she come, he or she comes running to mommy and daddy and you, you know, because you are so moody, you, are, you just dismiss them and you know they feel so bad, right? So we despise them and we... You know, at times we are controlled by our moods and our emotions. That tells us that the spirit of Christ still is not living in us. Because the spirit of Christ welcomes children. The spirit of Christ loves children and he holds them with high esteem. Amen? Amen. Amen. We want to look at a few stories in the Bible. I will not take much of your time, but as the spirit leads. Amen? Yeah. So we are going to look at the story of a king. Of course, a king who was a king while he was still very young. And his name is King Joash. King Joash. Yeah, King Joash. And we can find his story in the book of Second Chronicles, chapter 24. You can read at your own time. We shall not go through the whole uh, chapter because of time. And uh, you can start from uh, Second Chronicles, chapter, 20, chapter 22, from... Ahaziah and how he died and how Athaliah came and you know the story I'm sure. So um, King Joash, children, hello, hello. King Joash was a king at how, how many years was he? Yes, yes, the one in yellow, yes? Not eight, yes? Someone else shouts? Not 22. Nine, no, not nine. Yes? Seven, yes, good boys and girls, you know your Bibles. Those who did not get it, kindly revisit your Bibles. <laughs> so uh, King Josh was king at the age of, children at the age of, at the age of seven years old. Now, um, how many of us are seven years old? Anyone who is seven years old? Don't lie, God is watching. You are seven years old. Yes, I want her to have the mic kindly. Hadassah? Yes, Hadassah. What would you do if you were the queen of Kenya? If Kenya had a queen, what would you do? I want you to shout the answer. Uh, Anything you would do. What, you, would, what would you want to have for yourself? I'll help my country. Wow, she will help her country. Amen? Anyone else who is seven years old? Are you seven years old? Are you sure? Okay, yes, tell us. If you are the king of Kenya, what will you do? Your friend is telling you what you'll do. <laughs> yes. I know what I'll do. Uh -huh, what will you do? I will save the people of my country and, they, and I'll tell them not to fear because God is with them. Wow, amen. Amen, church. Amen for our brother. He will tell people not to fear because God is with them. I want one last answer. Anyone who's not seven years old, what would you do? Range, tell us. I could help the needy. Amen. Thank you so much. Helping the needy, telling people about God. We are raising patriots. Amen. Amen. So King Josh was not any different. Um, he had a zeal for God. And once you, you will read the story of King Josh at your own time, I believe. Uh, Second Chronicles chapter 22, chapter 23, chapter 24 talks about Josh. Um, Josh became king when he was seven years old, we have seen. And uh, he was brought up by the priest of God. And uh, the name of the priest was uh, Jehoiada. Yeah, Jehoiada was the name of the priest. And uh, let me just give you a short story on, on, uh, on his background. So his father Ahaziah died. And so when Ahaziah died, uh, his mother proceeded to kill the whole of the royal family because she wanted to be queen. And so she slayed everyone. But someone hid King Joash while he was still very, very young. And so King Joash was hidden away. And during the time when, King, when Joash was hidden, Athaliah reigned 
and of course all the wicked things were being done in Israel and it was not so good and pleasing in the eyes of the, the Lord. So Joash was taken to the temple and while at the temple the priest took care of him and he was fed by the living word. Amen. And so he grew up knowing all these things about God. And so when he was seven years of age, Jehoiada um, arranged the army and they were to overthrow Athalia by force. And so at King, uh, Queen Athalia was overthrown, she was killed, and Josh was set on the throne at the age of seven years old. And uh, he did pretty much what our children have just said. He repaired, he organized for the repair of the temple. He did a lot of good things for the Lord. And he served God well. As long as the priest Jehoiada was there, then King Josh did serve God well. And uh, we can see his zeal to repair the temple in the book of Second Chronicles 24. I think we'll just read that. Second Chronicles 24 from verse 6 to 8. A child, Second Chronicles 24, verse 6 to 8. And the Bible says, yes. Now he went out and made war against the Philistines and broke down the wall of Gath, the wall of Jabena, and the wall of Ashod. And he built cities around Ashod and among the Philistines. Is God that Second Chronicles 24? Second Chronicles. Chapter 24, verse 6 to 8. And the Bible says, yes. So the king called Jehoiada, the chief priest, and said to him, Why have you not required the Levites to bring in from Judah and from Jerusalem the collection according to the commandment of Moses, the servant of the Lord and mm -hmm. of the assembly of Israel for the temples of witness, for the sons of Azila that weak, wicked woman had broken into the house of God and had also presented all the dedicated things of the house of the Lord to the bold. Mm -hmm. then, then at the king's command, they made the, a chest and set it outside at the gate of the house of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Esther. Um, th j that just shows King Joash's zeal. I mean, he was zealous for God. At that young age, okay, the spirit of prophecy says that once he was king, sometime later he, he organized for the repair of the temple. But the point is, the king Joash was raised by the priest. He knew the ways of the Lord. And that is why later on, even in his, priestly, uh, in his kingly duties, he was able to glorify God. Amen? Amen. But something very, very sad happens to king Joash. Let's find out and see. What is this sad thing that happens to King Joash? Let's note that as long as king, the priest Jehoiada lived, this king did what was pleasing in the eyes of the Lord. As long as the priest was there, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And uh, I just want to quote a uh, uh, writing in the spirit of prophecy. Uh, Testimonies to the Church, Volume 2, page 232, paragraph 2. Um, I'll just pick a sentence from there. It says that Christian zeal is characterized by humility and prayer. Amen? Amen? Christian zeal is characterized by humility and prayer. So we cannot just have Christian zeal. We are busy. Uh, we are in every department in the church. Even our children are in every department in the church. You're busy here. You're preaching. Today you're in New Life. You're preaching. Then you're booked for the next five Sabbaths to preach in five different churches. And you are busy working for God. You know, that, that zeal, you should not just be zealous. It should be characterized by humility and what? Humility and prayer. If there's no humility, there's no prayer, but you are just zealous, your zeal is without knowledge, as stated in the book of Romans, chapter, Romans chapter 10, verse 2. We shall not read that. You can just note it down. Romans 10, verse 2 talks of the zeal that does not have knowledge. Now, something very sad happened to the King Joash. Once King Joash died, 
no, no, not King Joash, but once the priest Jehoiada died, then King Joash changed. And he didn't have the zeal anymore for God. He turned his back against God. And what does this tell us? That probably the king was just doing these things because, ah, you know, the priest, the priest Jehoiada has raised me up from my, you know, childhood and I cannot let him down. I'm just doing these things so that he can, you know, he can see them. How many of our children today are silent just because they are seated next to you in church? Once you leave them here alone at the corner, then they will have the small chatters. They will talk in church. They will do all manner of things. And, but they only keep silence because you are there, because you are watching. What if you send them to high school or university? Can you imagine what they can become just because you are not watching? It is sad, isn't it? It is a very sad state of affairs that there is a possibility of our children to wander away from the truth when we are not watching. And so, what can we do? What can we do in order to evade this? And I want to tell us parents, I am not a parent myself. I am not a parent myself yet. But one thing I have come to learn is that it is not enough for you to watch your child taking up leadership roles in the church. Parents, it is not enough for you to see your child standing here and singing. I want to tell my mom and dad, it is not enough for you to see Natalie preaching here at the pulpit. It is not enough, dear parents, it is not enough for them to even appear obedient in your sight. It is not enough. And therefore, what is required of us? What is required of our children? For them to stand the test that is coming ahead because we know that we are living in perilous times, right? Right? It is very important for us to have our children grounded. And these days, it is so difficult to be a children's teacher in church because we are competing with Disney. What else, children? What are we competing with? What do you guys watch? In Nickelodeon, what else? Netflix, what else? YouTube. Dora. Showmax, sorry, Showmax. Yes, what are we competing with, my brother? You can, I cannot hear you. Yeah, whatever he said. We are competing with all these things, yes? Amazon, we are competing with all these things and all these cartoons and all these, you know, these children programs that have so taken our children's attention. We are competing with the world and it's us against the world, but we have Christ with us, amen? And when we have Jesus with us, then we are sure to be victorious, amen? So, yeah, it's very difficult, by the way, to be a children's teacher these days because you have to find something that is so exciting, more exciting than the TV programs that they watch, more exciting than the Nickelodeon, than the Showmax and everything. But we have Christ with us, amen? And this is what we need for our children to stand. They need a total change of heart, amen? The Bible says that where your heart is, there your where your treasure is, there your heart is also. We need to teach them to treasure the word of God. And our children, what they need, they don't need the parents to be there checking all the time. Yes, you are in church. Are you keeping quiet? Are you taking notes? Are you opening your Bible when the preacher says, are you, are you being obedient to your parents? Are you being obedient to your teachers? No, they need Jesus. Amen? Our children need Jesus. Amen? Kindly shout, our children need Jesus. Our children need Jesus. Yes, our children indeed need Jesus. They do not need you to be constantly there watching their every move. They indeed need Jesus. Because just as King Josh, once the priest died, they turned away. And once you are out of the picture, dear parents, it is very unfortunate that many of our children may fall. Bearing in mind the kind of troublous times that are coming ahead, we need to keep our children on check. And they need to be trained as early as possible because the world is coming to an end. Amen? And we need Jesus to change their hearts. You cannot change their hearts by constantly scolding them and punishing them and being strict on them, having your eye on them all the time because the truth is that it is only Jesus who can change their hearts. And if Jesus has not changed the hearts of our children, then... When you're out of the picture, just as King Josh, they will turn away from the truth. And 
uh, many of us parents and guardians and teachers, we have a list of do's and don'ts. You know, uh, we'll have children in church and we are like, you know, <laughs> some of us parents give our, give our teachers so hard that um, we give our teachers hard times because children are in church, they're making noise and, you know, uh, once, when, when they make noise, all eyes are on the, the teacher, the teacher, where, nyamazisha watoto wako, or something like that. And yet you, and yet you as the parent, you have not in your home taught the child that the house of the Lord is a, is a place of reverence and they ought to carry themselves out in humility. They ought to be silent in the presence of a holy God, a God who owns the universe. We have not taught our children that our Lord is the king of the universe and he deserves all honor, he deserves all worship, he deserves all humility. Now, you are leaving it to the teachers of the church. And I want to give an, a small illustration here. Um, when your body is very dehydrated, like you, you haven't been taking water throughout the whole day, you haven't taken water, let me just use a day. I want to assume that we are Seventh-day Adventists and we have had the health message and we know the importance of water, amen? amen. Yes, so let's just assume this is a person who is not an Adventist, um, has been dehydrated has not taken water for the whole day. You can see Tisha Betty is now unleashing her bottle of water. <laughs> so um, they haven't taken water the whole day and they have a headache as a result. They have a what? They have a headache as a result. And we know that if we don't take water, we'll have some things like that. We'll, mo the most common one is having a headache. And this guy is so ignorant. I mean, he or she does not know that it's my body is lacking water and by the headache, my body is trying to communicate to me that, hey, there's a problem. You need to take what? You need to take water. And this guy runs to the chemist and buys what? Panadol, painkillers. And this guy takes the painkillers. The, the, the headache will go away, right? But the problem will not have been solved. The problem of what? Dehydration. This guy will not have solved the problem of dehydration. And so by taking these painkillers, this guy is telling the system, huh? the system is trying to communicate through the headache, hey, I'm trying to get your attention. Please take water. Please take water. Please take water. And this guy is like uh, brushing off the system. You, uh, this guy, by taking painkillers, he or she is like, you know what, keep quiet, keep quiet, keep quiet. You, you know, uh, you are just trying to numb the system, but then the dehydration is still what? The dehydration is still there. This is the same thing we are doing with our children today. We are giving them a lot of painkillers when the problem is dehydration. Here is what I mean. The, um, the, our children need Christ in order to stay silent in church. Amen? Our children need Christ in order to obey their parents, right? And so if you see your child is disobedient at home, uh, throwing tantrums all, uh, all around, and disobedient to parents, disobedient to children, that is, uh, something is trying to communicate to you that the spirit of Christ is lacking in your child, right? The spirit of Christ is lacking in your child. Your child needs Jesus. And what do you do? You scold the child. You punish the child. You, you do... You, corrects the child or disciplined him or her in anger. And we fail to realize that these children need who? They need Jesus. They need the spirit of Christ to dwell inside so that they may do that which is right. Amen? So we are busy giving our children a lot of painkillers when, when the problem is what? Dehydration. The problem is the lacking of Christ. And when we see all these signs, we are quick to, we are quick to correct them without leading them to the foot of the cross, without leading them to Jesus. And parents, without Christ, we can do nothing. Jesus says that he is the vine. We are the branches. We can do nothing. We can do utterly nothing without Jesus. Your children cannot obey their parents. They cannot obey you. They cannot honor you without Jesus. Amen? Amen, church? Yes. Um, so uh, I'd like us to read the book of Romans chapter 16, verse 26. Romans chapter 16, verse 26, a child. Romans 16, verse 26. Um, Romans chapter 16, verse 26, and it mm -hmm. says, Now, however, however that truth has been brought out into the open, 
through the writings of the prophet mm -hmm. and by the com command of the internal God, it mm -hmm. is made known to all nations mm -hmm. so that all may believe, all may be, all may believe and obey. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, all might believe and obey. My version says, yeah, I'll focus on the last part. Uh, this is the NIV version says, so that all the Gentiles might, might come to the obedience that comes from faith. I want us to note, obedience that comes from? Obedience that comes from what church? Obedience that comes from faith. It is not obedience that comes out of being forced. It is not obedience that comes out of you wanting to show off that you are, you are pleasing to your parents, that you are pleasing to your teachers, that you are pleasing to God. It is obedience that comes from what? Faith in Jesus Christ. And this is the obedience that our children need. Amen? Amen. This is the obedience that will take them to heaven. Amen? Because all these other obediences, the Pharisees were obedient to the law, weren't they? They were obedient to the law, but their obedience did not come from faith. Their obedience was for sure of, to be seen by other people. And that is what many of our children are doing today. They are obeying so that they can be seen by mom, they can be seen by dad, so that the elder can see them and elder will go and tell mom, hey, your, your child, your child is a good one, eh? I wish that my, you know, such kind of things. Children love such things, by the way. And... Uh, they do that so that they can be seen. But you know when Jesus comes back that such characters will be left. It is so sad. Both obeyed, both, children, both uh, sides obey, but is your obedience out of faith? I'm also talking to us adults. Is our obedience to God out of faith? Do we actually obey because we believe God? Or do we obey because, hey, I do not want hellfire. Hmm? I want to be in heaven, and it's of that tree that bears 12, fru uh, a fruit, 12, it bears 12 different kinds of fruits, the holy, and you want to see all these wonderful things. Do you obey because you have faith in God, or do you obey just to be seen? It's a challenge. It's a challenge to all of us today, and uh, it, is so, it is so saddening that many of our children are taking this road, and yet Christ calls us to something that is totally, totally different. And so as soon as our, child, our children are able to understand the love of Christ, I know at this, there's an age where you cannot start explaining to children. For example, if the child is around, uh, has not even started talking, you cannot tell me that you can explain to the child the love of Christ. But there are some things you can do. Read books like Child Guidance, um, yeah. A book, that's the one I know of, at least, on parenting. Well, and why it really speaks about parenting. There are some things you can do when they are still little. And once they have known, they are old enough to understand, as soon as they are old enough to understand, teach them of the love of Christ. Lead them to the foot of the cross and bring out in them the obedience that comes from faith. Amen? Amen. Uh, I'd like us to look at another story in the Bible. The story of Eli and his sons. Children, hello. Children, hello. How many know about the sons of Eli? Yes, I can see. Who wants to tell us something about the sons of Eli? Hadassah, you spoke. You spoke. I want someone who has not spoken. Yes, you. What did Eli's sons do? What, anything you know about Eli's sons? They used to steal from people when praying. Wow. Yeah, amen, amen. Something else that they used to do? Yes? You? Yeah, they used to steal money from the church. Uh -huh. Yes? Something else? Yes? They used to preach uh, the word of the devil and disobey. Yes, they were very disobedient, boys. They were very dis The last one at the corner, the one in the black... You, 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 yeah, you. What do you have to say about Eli's sons? You can just stand and shout. Yes? They used, they used to, they used, they used to 
make other people feel bad to feel good about themselves it's true that's true they used to make the israelites feel bad about themselves because okay let me just give the story eli's sons were the sons of a priest right right church yeah there was son eli was the pri- was a priest of god and he had sons what are the name of eli's sons children someone children of the children of eli who are the bible students any child from the congregation i'm neglecting the child in, the children in the congregation yes yes mitch shout eh uh-huh. yes hofni and finia say amen to mitch another amen amen yes train up your children in the lord it's good to encourage them to read the bible hofni and finis were children of eli and uh, they were very very disobedient children and uh, it reached a point that they would steal sacri- the sacrifices of the lord and people were displeased you know these people who come to church and because elder so and so is uh, you know doing this and that then they're like ah mimi new life sikanyagi tena kwa nini we ukusikia sijui nani nani alifanya nini and we leave the church because and we had people like that in the, in the israelite community they were like hofni and finis no i'm not even going to bring my sacrifices to the house of the lord because they are an abomination okay and so many people were discouraged from um uh, bringing the, their gifts to the lord and this sin that they did was very very displeasing in the sight of the lord and you can get their story in the book of first samuel chapter chapter 3 i'm almost done for those that are quite impatient i know children someone should not take that much time because i also want them to concentrate so first samuel chapter 3 uh talks about the story of the of uh, the children no sorry first samuel chapter 2 from verse 12 to 26 talks about how the children of eli were so so disobedient and uh, i want someone to read first samuel chapter 2 verse 17 a child first samuel chapter 2 verse 17 first samuel chapter 2 verse 17 mm-hmm. and it says yes. this this sin of the sons of eli was extremely serious in the lord's sight mm. because they treated the offerings to the lord with such disrespect yes they treated the offerings my version says that the lord's uh, the, the lord's offerings were treated with contempt and this was a very very great sin in the eyes of the lord and uh, god was not pleased and he went further to talk to eli through an a man um, uh, a man of god was sent to eli that's from verse 27 to around uh, 236 and uh, the man of god spoke to eli about the evils of his sons and if you read the spirit of prophecy uh, specifically the books um, you can check uh, patriarchs and prophets majorly um you'll see the story of eli's sons and how they displeased the lord and it was a great sin in the eyes of the lord and uh, god did not take this sin lightly he was determined to destroy these children how sad how sad it is that god himself was willing to destroy these children because they were not they cheated his offerings with contempt and i just want to read a quote from the book of um patriarchs and prophets page 578 paragraph 3 listen to what it says it says this eli did not manage his household according to god's rules for family government he followed his own judgment the fond father overlooked the faults and sins of his sons in their childhood flattering himself that after a time they would outgrow their evil tendencies many are now making a similar mistake they think they know a better way of training their children than that which god has given in his word they foster wrong tendencies in them urging as an excuse they're too young to be punished which still they become older and can be reasoned with thus wrong habits are left to strengthen until they become second nature the children grow up without restraint with traits of character that are a lifelong curse to them and are liable Uh, sorry and are liable to be reproduced in others this is so so sad 
that children, through, through the parents, children can actually get tendencies that will be passed to generations and that will, curses that will live for their, during their entire lifetime, just like the sons of Eli. Do you know what the man of God said? This is so sad. I want us to read First Samuel chapter 2 and uh, verse, um, verse, verse 31 to 33. First Samuel chapter 2, verse 31 to 33. First Samuel chapter 2, verse 31 to 33. Yes. And it says, mm -hmm. listen, the time is coming when I will kill all the young men in your family and your clan, so mm -hmm. that no man in your family will live to be old. Mm -hmm. You will be troubled and look with envy on all the blessings I will give to the other people of Israel. Mm -hmm. But no one is in my family will ever uh, again live to old age. Yet I will keep one of your descendants alive, mm -hmm. and he will serve me as priest, but he will become blind and lose all hope, and mm -hmm. all your other descendants will die a violent death. Can you imagine? That is so sad. That the curse that Hophni and Phineas received actually went down to generations and God promised that none of your descendants are going to live to old age. I know, okay, personally as Natalie, I do not want to, you know, I, I do not want the weaknesses that come with old age, but I'd love to live long too that time and still be strong like Joshua was. But then they were even denied this privilege. And it's sad that we can, we are, as, as parents, I know I'm not a parent myself, but as parents, you can actually contribute to a curse that will go on for generations. And this is indeed very, very sad, especially uh, in these last days. There is a certain class of parents and guardians coming up that does not punish the children. I mean, evil tendencies are stayed on the children, are, are entertained, they are developed until they are fully grown, until the, the child becomes so rebellious that you cannot, um, you cannot uh, you know, change their behavior anymore because they have already built up these uh, bad habits. And it's so sad that uh, I can, I've seen this in our church because back then in the days, uh, when I was still very, very young, on Sabbath afternoon, you would not find a child in the parking lot, I don't know, playing football. You know, uh, boys during our days are so cheeky. <laughs> with the, uh, once service is over and once we've eaten lunch, you'd find the boys with chupas amaji and they are busy playing football. But once they see the elder, it is game over. And everyone runs away. But because uh, the elders in, uh, back in our days would actually correct the child. And if you dare say to your parent, Utapeleko kwa mzazi, wa zingine. So it's better you just keep quiet. Huh? So do, during our days, we, people would, uh, you know, a child would belonged to the community. But these days, if an elder dares, eh? what will you parents do? You know what you'll do, right? I see, my child, hmm? how dare you? You know, some of us even go as far as scolding an elder in front of the child, surely parents. That is not right. A child should belong to the community, not to you as an individual. When someone else corrects you, of course there are some forms of correction which are not pleasing even in the sight of the Lord. Sorry. Are not pleasing even in the sight of the Lord. I mean, going to very... Uh, going to extremes with the children and, you know, hurting them so badly to the point of that they're nearly dying. We're not talking about that. But just slight correction from, and discipline when it's necessary from an elder in the church should be accepted. I mean, why should you? I mean, he's, he's even trying to do the work that you have neglected huh? and you are busy. What are you doing? You're hindering the work. And yet you yourself, you have neglected this work. So what am I trying to say? This is what I'm trying to say. We should not go to extremes with children, but at the same time, do not neglect your duty that the Lord has so entrusted unto you. And um, 
yeah, I'm, this is my, I'm almost finishing. I'm closing at this point. Um, there's so much I wanted to say which I will not because concentration span of the children is quite small and I do not want to tire them. So you can read the book Child Guidance, uh, chapter 48 and chapter 80 really intrigued me and so much. And uh, just the last thing that I want to say to us is that let us not be extreme with our children, too harsh on them, and at the same time, let us not let them go and just do nothing and watch while they build up these bad habits. Let us be responsible parents and guardians, and even youth ambassadors, I'm also speaking to us, these children, by the way, look up to elderly people. If you're an ambassador, these children, they look up to you. Do you know how excited they, they, they feel when you just know their name and you're a big person who's not their parent, maybe? They really look up to us. And it's up to us to lead by example, every one of us, so that these children may be directed to the right path. So um, my final story is coming from the book of um, Matthew. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 22, sorry. Matthew chapter 22. We shall just read a few, a few verses. We won't read the whole story. So this is a story of the parable of the wedding banquet. And uh, I want us to read Matthew 22, verse 11 and 12. A child, you can read for us our second last. Yes? The one in yellow? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Someone, yes. You'll read for us the last verse. Matthew 22, verse 11 and 12. Matthew chapter 22, verse 11 to 12, and it yes. says, mm -hmm. The king went in to look at the guest and saw a man who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The king asked him, but the man said nothing. Yes, thank you so much. Um, this is, the, as I said, this is the parable of the wedding banquet. And uh, the king walked in. You know how others were invited and they did not come, so he invited everyone. And as he's walking, he sees someone who does not have the wedding garment. Okay, I don't know, this is a very special wedding because we know weddings, you'll see one with this color there. But for this specific wedding, everyone was required to have a specific wedding garment. But when the king came, he, he found someone who did not have the wedding garment and the guy was speechless. If you read, uh, you can read Bible commentaries on this. You can read the spirit of prophecy on this. But uh, the book of Revelation says that uh, the saints are clothed in the righteousness of who? In the righteousness of who? In the righteousness of Christ. And so many of us will be obedient to the word. So many of our children will be obedient to their parents. But they will have a different wedding garment because they have Okay, the Bible tells us in Philippians to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. But it continues to say that it is who? It is God that, that is Philippians chapter 2 verse 12 and 13. It tells you in verse 12 to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Verse 13 says, it is God that works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So many of us are working out our salvation. So many of our children are working out their salvation, trying to be obedient, having a checklist where they do this, they don't do that. And for, we forget that we are supposed to put on the righteousness of Christ. We are not supposed to put on our own righteousness because the Bible says that our righteousness is like what? Our righteousness is like filthy rags. Friends, there is nothing you can offer to God. In as much as these children are highly esteemed by heaven, in as much as Jesus holds them with so, um, so I mean, he, he places such a great value on them, they cannot get to heaven with their own works. Amen? Amen. We have to put on the righteousness of Christ because our righteousness is like filthy rags. And what, uh, what am I trying to say? We need to have the Holy Spirit in us. Amen. Teach your children, as young as they are, to die to self and let Christ live in them. Amen. Because if we do not die to self, friends, we do not give room to the Holy Spirit to work in us. And so we need to die to ourselves. We need to die to self so that whatever we do, is controlled by who? 
is controlled by God. And therefore, our children will not find it hard to remain silent in the presence of the Lord. Our children will not find it hard to obey their parents. Our children will not find it hard to read their Bibles and to pray every day. In fact, they will be reminding you, Mommy, it's time for prayer. It's time for worship. They will be so zealous for God. Why? Because their obedience is out of faith. Amen? Amen. And so I'm not only urging the children, but also us. The reason why our children do not, have not yet learned of this is because many of us ourselves have not died to self. And we are busy living. We are living, we are correcting our children in, uh, with a lot of anger, with a lot of frustration. You know, the, yani, our children wonder, you, you want me to obey you and uh, you, you, want, you tell me that Jesus is meek and humble. I'm not seeing Christ in you. Why should I obey you? Why should I follow this, you know, this agitation that is coming from you and you know all this anger and all this unchristlikeness? And they wonder, which God are you professing? And so it all starts with us. We need to die to self, amen? And have an obedience that comes from what? Comes from faith. And it is then that our God will be able to use our children. And just as the book of Psalms says, out of the lips of infants, he will call forth his praise. And during these end times, God has a special work for our children, amen? How many of us believe that God has a special work for our children? Even though we don't, thank you so much, even though we do not know how, or we do not know uh, how God is going to use them, indeed God has a special work for these little ones. And God cannot use them if they have not died to self, amen? And so we need to teach our children, as young as they are, to die to self, let Christ live in them, have an obedience that comes from faith, and it is then that God will be able to call forth his praise. Out of the lips of who? Out of the lips of the infants and our little children. Be blessed.